Now let's uh, join together calling upon the name of the Lord in prayer. Eternal God, uh, we draw near with gratitude, thankful that there is one upon whom we can rely, one on whom we can call, who is always faithful and true. And we discover on life's journey that man's breath is in his nostrils and it is vain to rely upon him, even upon ourselves. None of us are constant and altogether faithful. And there is one friend that sticks closer than any brother. And in calling upon you, we call upon one whose character is always the same. One who never changes. The great Jehovah who is who he is, who he always has been and who he always shall be. And you are to be relied upon always. The words that you have spoken will stand, and you are faithful in judgment, faithful in executing justice. The promises you give, you adhere to, and no vow that you have uttered uh, will ever be broken. And we thank you, O Lord, that when we open the pages of Scripture, we open a book upon which we can rely. For it is the very breath of God. It is your unchanging word. And so we praise you when uh, everything seems to be in tumult. And uh, when things are so disordered, when they are in confusion and chaos, that there is a river which makes glad the city of the Lord, the holy place wherein the Lord most high hath his abode. And therefore nothing shall her remove. And you will prove to be a helper, and that right early. Uh, we pray that you would deal with us on the basis of grace this morning. And pray that you would receive us uh, since we come in the name of Christ and pleading his merits. We have drunk wine of astonishment. And uh, our prayers have indeed been answered by fearful things in righteousness. And we cannot doubt that you have shown yourself in the judgment that is abroad in the land. It has encompassed the world. And it is remarkable how severity and mercy are mingled together in it. It is doing so much harm on one level but yet in not as much harm as it could on another. And in these things you are calling us to self-examination. Oh, what have we done with the offers of grace and mercy? What have we done with Christ who is revealed so plainly in the gospel? When he has offered himself to us and invited us into his fellowship to experience his goodness and to taste it and to see it for ourselves what have we done with these things we pray to recognize a call to self-examination in the things that are around about us we bless you nonetheless for the good gifts that we enjoy daily we praise you that we still have warmth and shelter and comfort and even if we are confined to our homes in a way that we did not foresee or a way that we would not have welcomed, nonetheless are we not shut in? Are we not shut in by the Lord? And are we not shut in with the Lord? In the secret place may we recognize that you are already there, ready to receive us and ready to welcome us. May we recognize ourselves as being truly called into your fellowship by this providence, called to that silent ministry of intercession which is best done in the secret place we ask O oh lord that you would be with us all as families in our congregation uh, be with parents and children may the time that they spend together be a time of good spiritual quality so that the bonds between fathers and sons and mothers and daughters husbands and wives brothers and sisters 
may be more deep, and more lasting and more real. We have neglected each other uh, for far too long. And we pray that, as in the days of John the Baptist, you would turn the hearts of the fathers back to their children and the hearts of the children back to their fathers. In a day when families are disintegrating all around us and when marriages are being broken and marriage itself is being assaulted constantly, even by the authorities of the state, O Lord, have mercy. And may we use this time profitably. We ask that uh, you would be with the uh, Prime Minister of the land and when he is still in recovery and when he is out of immediate danger, may his own time of seclusion be a time of much thought and much reflection. The ministers of our land are ministers of God who are there to administer in the Lord's name and for the good of the people. And so we pray that he would consider the place that the Lord has in his own life. We pray for the first minister and we pray for all rulers of state and the queen and the royal family too. And uh, how silent our rulers are. And um, if they would but recognize, and if we all would, the one who has smitten us, and that he who has smitten us is the one who will heal too, that we would all say, come and let us return to the Lord, for he has smitten us, but he will heal us also. And on the third day, he will revive us again. I'll be with those who are elderly and weak and those who especially feel the loneliness of this time. Oh, be a companion to them, we pray. Be a husband to Israel and stand in the gap when we feel that isolation so much. We pray that you would open the scriptures to us now, make us receptive to them, that the seed might fall on ground that is well prepared. We are so familiar now with our own hearts and the hearts of others that we realize but nothing but the power of God will awaken us to do any good, to think any good thought or to speak any good word or to do any good act. So, Lord, prepare us now for the hearing of the word and indeed for the singing of it too, that we might sing with the understanding and sing with the Spirit and that we would hear with the attitude of Samuel, who said, Speak, Lord, for your servant hears. In Christ's name, Amen. Second reading, and for our text, to the prophecy of Zechariah. And this one comes immediately after Haggai. It is the second last book in the Old Testament. So just before Matthew in the New Testament, you have Malachi, and before that you have Zechariah. And in chapter 1, uh, Zechariah, by the way, is raised up along with uh, Haggai, and this prophecy is given very shortly after Haggai gives his. We read that one earlier. So uh, Zechariah, chapter 1, and uh, a few verses from the beginning. In the eighth month of the second year of Darius, the word of the Lord came to Zechariah, the son of Berechiah, the son of Ido, the prophet, saying, The Lord has been very angry with your fathers. Therefore say to them, Thus says the Lord of hosts, Return to me, says the Lord of hosts, and I will return to you says the Lord of hosts. Do not be like your fathers, to whom the former prophets preached, saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts, Turn now from your evil ways and your evil deeds. But they did not hear, nor heed me, says the Lord. Your fathers, where are they? And the prophets, do they live forever? Yet surely my words and my statutes, which I commanded my servants, the prophets, did they not overtake your fathers? So they returned and said, Just as the Lord of hosts determined to do to us, 
according to our ways and according to our deeds. So he has dealt with us. Again, may the Lord bless that uh, reading from his own word. These are the introductory words to Zechariah's prophecy. And uh, I want us to take as our text uh, verse 3. Zechariah 1 verse 3, where the Lord says to the people, Return to me, and I will return to you. Return to me, and I will return to you. Now we'll go into the context of these words more fully as we go on. But I think it's just enough uh, to say for now that um, the context here is set in Jerusalem. Just after the Jews returned from their 70-year captivity in Babylon. And uh, having been back in the land for around 16 years, God raises up uh, two special prophets. They are Haggai and Zechariah. They are both raised at the same time, and they both carry essentially the same message. And what they're doing is urging the people to get on with the task of rebuilding God's temple, which still lies in ruins. So that is the basic context. As I said, uh, we'll develop it a little more fully as we go on. Now, it's in that context then that God gives us these words. Return to me and I will return to you. And I think we can probably best describe these words as a conditional promise. A conditional promise. Now, clearly... Uh, the words do contain a promise. I will return to you. He doesn't say perhaps I will return or I may return to you or anything like that. He says I will return. So that's a, a promise and it's a wonderful promise. I will return. But although it is a promise, you'll notice that it is conditional. And the condition that must be fulfilled is that we, first of all, return to him. In other words, if you return to me, I will return to you. It's obvious, by the way, that both parties have moved from where they were. Um, The people are not where they were because they are called to return, but neither is God where he was. Because he says that he will return too. So neither the people nor God are where they were. The important thing is to recognize in what way both parties have moved. Why both parties have moved? Why are the people not where they were? Why is God not where he was? And of course, it's important to understand the relationship between these two movements. Who who is it that moves first? Who moves second? Who has to move back first, and who moves back second, and so on. But both parties have moved. Now, I want to look with you, first of all, at the promise itself. And we'll do that this morning. I will return, says the Lord. A wonderful promise. And tonight, I want us to look at the condition that needs to be fulfilled. And that is, you return to me. So then this morning, let's just look together at, I will return to you. Now, the obvious truth implied in these words is just what I said a minute ago, that at the very time of writing them or speaking them through the prophet, God is not where he was. He has, in fact, withdrawn from his people. He has left them left them in the sense that he used to be with them. Now, I suppose uh, we all know, or we should know, that in the ultimate sense, God cannot leave his people. In other words, he can't leave them altogether. The promise is always true that I will never leave you, nor will I forsake you. Who can separate us from the love of God? 
who can separate us from the Lord Jesus Christ? Nothing. Not, nothing in life, nothing in death. No angel, no principality, no power, nothing that's present, nothing that's to come can separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. We thank God for that. But nonetheless, although he can't leave us like that, he can still leave us for a time. And the ways in which God can leave us are so severe that they can be spoken of as a forsaking. Now, it's sometimes said, and I understand why it's said, that God forsook Christ so that we might never be forsaken. I understand the way in which that's meant. But nonetheless, the Bible does speak of God forsaking his people. For example, in Isaiah, God says this, For a small moment I have forsaken thee, but with great mercies I will gather thee. So that word forsaken, which we consider to be such a a severe word, is nonetheless used for God's dealings with his own people. He may indeed for a while forsake them. That, That brings before us the gravity of his leaving. For a small moment I have forsaken thee, but with great mercies I will gather thee. So what's happened here is that after 16 years in the land, 16 years after they came back with such joy and gladness, God has actually returned from them. He has withdrawn from his people. Now, I think the first thing we need to understand is what is actually meant by God leaving his people or forsaking them. And the kind of leaving or forsaking that's spoken of here is often referred to in the scriptures as taking away the light of his countenance from them. Now, sometimes we use that expression in prayer, and it's no wonder because it appears often in the scriptures. We ask the Lord to lift upon us the light of his countenance, or not to remove from us the light of his countenance. But what does that really mean? Well, I think in some ways the easiest way to understand that is by making a simple comparison between the light of God's countenance shining on us on the one hand and the light of the sun shining on the earth. When the sun shines on the earth, it gives two qualities essentially. It gives light and it gives warmth. And it's that light and uh, heat the light and the warmth from the sun that makes the earth fruitful, of course, by the grace of God. But in the same way, the shining of God's countenance brings light and warmth to our poor dark souls. It brings light to our minds and warmth to our hearts. And so when God shines upon us like that, we have a sense of his favor we see and we understand his loving kindness and his tender mercies. And along with that, with these things in our minds, we have a deep spiritual joy and a sense of peace in our hearts. And we are able to delight ourselves in God because the sun is shining. There is a a light from his countenance to illuminate our minds with the wonder of his truth and to warm our hearts in appreciation of these truths. We don't just know, we enjoy what we know, and we delight in the God whom we know. Now, when God removes the light of his countenance, we lose that light and warmth. In other words, very simply, our minds, instead of being illuminated, are plunged into darkness and into confusion. And instead of our hearts being warm, they become cold. We lose that sense of favor, and we lose the joy in the Lord and the ability to delight ourselves in God. Now, when God removes the light of his countenance like that, we know it's not always going to stay like that. We we just thought of that. A, a couple of Sabbaths ago, the, the night always gives way to the morning with God's people. The sun of righteousness will rise again with healing in his wings. God will come back and he'll come back with his light and he'll come back with his warmth 
and with a strong sense of his favour. But when he removes that light of his countenance, it's a very real thing. And it leads to the dark night, the soul. Now, if we don't give heed to the removal of his countenance, if we're, if we're not concerned by it, if we're not anxious about the fact that we are in confusion, and if we're not anxious about the fact that our hearts have have grown cold, then God will usually move up that judgment and he will accompany it with other judgments. And Haggai tells us what these judgments were. And we read them. Um, God placed a kind of curse on their wealth, on their accumulations, and on their spirit of covetousness. He he calls them to consider your ways. He says, you've sown much, you bring in little. You eat, you never have enough. You drink, you're never full enough. You clothe yourselves, but no one's warm. And you earn your wages. And he says, you put them into a bag with holes. They just disappear. You can't even tell where they go. They, They just take wings and they disappear. Consider your ways. He says, you looked for much. You thought you had much. But he says, it came too little. When you took it home, God says, I blew it away. I just blew it away. You don't know where it went, but I just blew it away. God essentially dried up their supplies. Now, God could have dealt more severely with them than that. But it's important to remember that just like any father with a a, a care for his sons, God's chastisement is always graded. It's graded in tenderness. It's graded in mercy. No one one immediately begins with a rod. Um, He removes the light of his countenance and then he inflicts a judgment. If they don't respond to removing the light of the countenance, he inflicts a judgment. Could have been worse. Um, As I said last week, I think it was, or the week before, when uh, God speaks through Hosea, he describes uh, dealing in chastisement with Israel and Judah um, as though he were a moth or a lion. Now, there's a very great difference between a moth and a lion. A lion, of course, is more severe, but a moth can be just as destructive in its own way. The moth nibbles away. Uh, And it eventually just wreaks complete havoc. Now, here, thankfully, he is not coming to these returning exiles like a lion. He's just coming like a moth. He's just nibbling away at what they've got. I I don't know if it's ever puzzled yourself that God is somehow, in spite of the fact that he's given you much, he he somehow seems to take it away from you. You're not valuing it. Um, He's judging your acquisitions. He's judging your property. He's judging what you have. Now, um, for a long time, the Lord has withdrawn the light of his countenance from our own land and from our churches too. And um, I think many of the Lord's people have been aware that there's a lack of true light, even in the proclamation of the word. And there's a, a lack of felt warmth. People who have known the nearness of the Lord and people who have known the light of his countenance and enjoyed the light of his countenance will say so often, Some, something is missing. Something is missing. But no, it's more than something missing. He has unleashed a judgment. And it's a kind of judgment, like I mentioned in the prayer, that balances mercy and severity in an extraordinary way. At one level, there is so much mercy. The the death rate, and I speak, I hope, with, with compassion and sensitivity, isn't all that high. It could be so, so much higher. But the moth has consumed, and it's consumed much more than we realize. The the greatest devastations in many respects on our land are ones that we haven't even realized yet, with shut businesses and people out of work and all kinds of distress and difficulty. The moth, the moth has been eating away what we've been heaping up for ourselves with no word of God. Well, then, the text here tells us that God has withdrawn the light of his countenance, taken away a sense of joy and peace, and he's now sent a judgment. 
the moth is consuming their wealth. Now, when did this happen? Well, it's easy to put our finger on it. Sixteen years before this, they had returned from Babylon, and they returned as a chastened people. And you know, when we're chastened and we recover, we think we'll never sin again. And they came back from Babylon with such great rejoicing because God was working for them. Uh, They were singing coming back from Babylon. The Lord has done great things for us. And when they were singing, the unbelieving world was looking on and they were recognizing it. The Lord has done great things for them. Um, And that's what happens too when we are basking in the light of God's countenance, when we have a strong sense of his favor and we're um, stirred by the work of his grace and kindness. The world notices the church then. The world notices the church. And immediately when they came back to the land, although it was difficult to set about the task, they set about rebuilding it. And you'll notice that the first thing they did was to rebuild the temple. Now, I'm assuming here that they built houses, modest houses for themselves. Of course they would. Of course they had to. But the first serious work that they engaged in was rebuilding the temple. Now, rebuilding the temple in the Old Testament is just rebuilding the church of God in the land. That's what it is. That's the task that was confronting these exiles, to rebuild the church of God in the land, rebuild her in her government, in her worship, which is her greatest quality, and in her discipline too. And you'll notice that that was the first step to restoring the land. The the first step to getting... Um, not just the city of Jerusalem, but the land of Judah, the first step to getting it all back was to rebuild the temple of God. The the land, the city or the land cannot really be rebuilt without the church being rebuilt. That's why Zerubbabel's work as the architect of God's temple here is more important than Nehemiah's work as the one who was rebuilding the wall of the city. Zerubbabel must always come before Nehemiah. The rebuilding of the church must always come before the rebuilding of the city. And that's why our our greatest concern as the people of God in this covenanted nation, and I keep referring to the fact that it is a covenanted nation, our greatest concern must be for the rebuilding of the church of God. We, We can mourn and lament about the tragedy in the world around us and about the state of the nation, the abhorrent laws that are being passed and so on. And nothing that I say is meant to slacken our hand and putting our hand to any of that. But believe me, it is all a waste of time unless our primary concern is with the worship of God and the beauty and the order of his own house. A rebuilt temple must precede the rebuilding of Jerusalem. Zerubbabel must come before Nehemiah. Now, the the reason... Uh, for slackening the work is really the opposition that came their way when they started that work. Um, God left them, and and He left them when they stopped the work. But why why did He stop? Why did they stop the work? They were doing so well; they had begun so enthusiastically. But the work slowed and then it stopped. Why? Why did it happen? Well, I think we need to distinguish here between the apparent reason and the real reason. If if you were going to look at this from the outside, you would say that that the reason why the people stopped building was because of the opposition that came their way. And there's no doubt that it did. It especially came from the Samaritans in the north. Now, These were their kind of half-brothers. They were people who still had a kind of religion of Jehovah. They were the liberals of the day. And the liberals said, oh, we're very happy to join with you in building this temple. Let's all build it together to the glory of Jehovah. But of course, that was not acceptable. And so what happened was that the Samaritans or the liberals turned their guns against the people of God. And they turned their guns using the government to get at the people of God. The very government that had allowed God's people to come back and to start working was now a government that was telling them to stop. 
And this constant sniping and the constant opposition meant that they, that they just weakened. They began to see the difficulty of the task. They realized that to actually rebuild this temple to anything like its former glory was absolutely formidable. And to try and rebuild the city and to rebuild a nation which just lay in ruins was just suddenly a task that seemed so big. But it didn't seem so big when they started it. In other words, the the real reason for slackening is, is not so much the opposition that came against them, but something to do with themselves. It's, it's how they responded to that opposition. If they had stayed vigilant, if they had armed themselves with God's armor, as we saw last week, if they had kept that shield of, of faith high, and if they had kept wielding the sword of the Spirit, and if they had kept a breastplate of righteousness on and so on, as they had done in Babylon, they would have resisted the fiery darts of the wicked one. The assaults of the Samaritans wouldn't mean anything. The devices, the intrigues, and the stratagems of Satan would get nowhere. But they didn't stay vigilant. They can't have. It's never the opposition of the world that gets you down, friend. It's not. It's not the assaults of the evil one that make everything look so black. It's our own poor response to these things. The world's what it is. The world's always going to oppose. The world's going to laugh. The the world's going to assault. The world's going to attack. The world's going to persecute. None of that's new. The only thing that can make the difference is how you respond to it. And whether or not you have the armor on and whether or not you are fighting for God. So for some reason they weakened and their hands slackened and they ceased to work on the temple, uh, slowly but surely, until finally the work more or less stopped altogether. Now, the interesting thing here is, you see, that you can't have a vacuum in the heart. It's, it's one thing to say that these people stopped working on the temple, but that doesn't give you the full picture. That wasn't their whole sin. The problem is that they replaced working for God with something else. They replaced it with working for themselves. And what Haggai draws our attention to is the lavish attention that they paid to their own houses. More elaborate dwellings. Now, I mentioned earlier that they had temporary ones. They they were obviously bound to have that. They couldn't possibly live in a country without a house. But now, suddenly, instead of their houses being something that enabled them to do something for God, their houses became what really mattered more than anything else. They were more expensive. They were panelled houses. They were going up to the mountains and bringing back wood just to beautify, to adorn, and to extend their own houses. And God says, consider your ways. Get up to these mountains, he says. Bring wood and build the temple that I may take pleasure in and be glorified. Their houses were more important than the house of God. Now, this is a subtle thing, you see, because these people are not reverting to the obvious idolatry of their fathers. Someone once said that it's it's an interesting thing that that overt idolatry was something that had been burnt out of them by the captivity. They, They never again went back to overt idolatry. That's true. But although they haven't reverted to overt idolatry here, they've moved to the idolatry of things. The idolatry of possessions, the idolatry of what we acquire and what we have or even what we could have. They're obsessed with their own dwellings and their own possessions. And that just shows you, friends, something that you probably know if you're honest with yourself, and that is just how corrupt the human heart is, how deceitful it is above all things, and how desperately wicked, and how great the tendency in all our hearts, and I'm leaving nobody out of this, including myself, how great the tendency to replace God with yourself, the greatest idol of all. Your greatest idol is yourself. I suppose in one way the interesting thing is, you see, that anybody passing through this land, any visitor going through 
Judea or coming to Jerusalem will say, well, you know, these exiles, uh, they're actually doing very well. They're building these lovely homes and so on, and it's amazing how dedicated they are, how hardworking they are, and so on. But the seven eyes of God, which run to and fro over all the earth, doesn't see things like that. God isn't impressed with our houses. Why should he be impressed with our houses? He is rather distressed with the neglect of his own sanctuary. Now, let all of you, all of you as men, women, and children too, ministers too, including myself, what would anyone think mattered most to us? What would anyone think mattered most to us? Is is the temple of God, is the church of God our own chief desire? Do we pray like the psalmist in Psalm 122 for the peace and prosperity of God's house? Is that is that a prayer that dominates our own heart and soul? The sad thing is that these people were so different in Babylon. You remember the psalm that they sang uh, when the Babylonians were mocking them and wanted to hear them making mirth and so on. They, they refused and they hung up their harps for a time in the midst of the willows. And then they realized that whatever was coming their way, they could never stop praising God. If thee, Jerusalem, I forget, skill part from my right hand. Let me never play an instrument again. Let, let me do nothing unless I do it for the glory of God. My tongue, let it cleave to my mouth if I do thee forget Jerusalem. If I can't praise you and if I can't speak of you, let me speak of nothing. Let me not speak of the weather. Let me not speak of politics. Let me speak of nothing. Let my tongue cleave to my roof, the roof of my mouth if I forget Jerusalem. And if I do not set thee above my chief joy. In other words, let the cause of God be first and foremost in my life. Even above my chief joy, whatever that is, whatever is in this world is very, very precious and rightly so in our hearts. Let the things of God be more than that. More than that. That's how they were just 16 years ago. Things can change quite quickly, both for the worse and for the better, quicker than we think. That's sometimes an encouragement in terms of things turning round again. They can turn better, quicker than we think. But in 16 years, this people had degenerated from being a zealous people, worshipping God, to a people who were now looking after themselves. What mattered now was their houses. For us, we can say houses, cars, properties, pensions, inheritances, comforts. All of these things are good, just like their houses were good. But they're never good when they become idols. And the only person who can assess that is yourself. And let me warn you that you'll always be charitable in your assessment of yourself. Your lust for these things will never be called covetousness, really. You, you might call it that in other people, but you'll be very slow to call it in yourself. Only you can examine yourself. Only you can. So God has started to withdraw these things. He's withdrawn the light of his countenance. He did it 16 years after they were full of the light of God's countenance. And he's followed that up with judgment upon their possessions. And he's done that because of sin. Uh, I wonder if you're where you were 16 years ago. A good number of you listening here can go back over 16 years Christian experience. Are you where you were? Is your enjoyment of God what it was? Can you say that you know the light of his countenance as you knew it 16 years ago? Reduce that to 10. Some of you have had five years Christian experience. What can you say? Is the light of God's countenance more or less? Is he somehow judging what you've got rather than blessing what you've got? Uh, before I leave this part of it, there's one question I think that needs addressing. And it's this, and I've sometimes heard it discussed, perhaps not exactly in this form, but I think this is more or less where the question has been going. Does, does God 
sovereignly withdraw the light of his countenance. In other words, just does he just do it sometimes to test us? Or is it always a chastisement for our sins? When we lose a sense of God's favor, and uh, when we're in darkness and confusion, and we have no warmth towards God in our soul, is that just something that God inflicts upon us as a kind of test? Or is it a, a chastisement? Now, uh, with respect, there are some people who say that God does this for a test, that he just takes away the light of his countenance, he takes away the warmth, and that he just does it as a test. But I want to say quite honestly that I don't see this in Scripture, and neither do I think that that is consistent with God's ways. But uh, supremely, I don't see it in Scripture. I think we see things that are like it in Scripture, things that you can confuse with it in Scripture. And um, I suppose what I mean by that is this. Take, for example, uh, Job's affliction. I suppose he might be seen as a case in point. You could say, well, look, didn't Job lose the light of God's countenance? And he had done nothing. Was he not a, an upright and a just man, and he suddenly lost the light of God's countenance? But you see, you see, that's to confound things that differ. It's to confuse things that differ. We're nowhere told that Job lost the light of God's countenance when God afflicted him. God certainly afflicted him. He allowed an affliction. He allowed Satan to get at him. But that doesn't mean that Job lost the sense of God's favor or that he lost God's light or that he lost any warmth in his heart. He didn't lose these things until he started to complain against God about his situation. Um, in other words, the light of his countenance was something Job enjoyed even in the midst of God's affliction. And he continued to enjoy it until he sinned. Uh, you know, at the end of the book, I remember looking at the book in detail with you some time ago, but um, God rebuked Job's friends for not speaking correctly concerning himself as Job had done. Now, that's a, that's a reference to the fact that uh, um, Job had a proper understanding of God's judgment and, uh, and so on, as opposed to his friends who always said that God uh, afflicted people always because of their sins. And Job was right in that. That doesn't mean that Job was right in everything he said. Uh, there are times when Job is questioning the, the, ju the judgment of God towards himself. Uh, there are times when he's complaining about his situation and so on, and, and using language that is not right. And that's when he lost God's countenance. He couldn't find the Lord anywhere. But you'll notice when the affliction came, he wasn't like that. He justified God. He justified God's dealings. He said he came into this world naked and he would leave it naked. And um, the, the Lord did what was right. And we're told in all these things, Job sinned not with his mouth. Sinned not with his mouth. Job rose, tore his robe, shaved his head, fell to the ground. And he worshipped and he said, naked I came from my mother's womb, naked I shall return there. The Lord gave and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. In all this, Job did not sin or charge God with wrong. Um, it's one thing for adversity to come. It's another thing for adversity to stay. And, and can I say it's another thing altogether, too, for adversity to stay for a long, long time. And, and that's when the sin can come in. That's when the unbelief can come in. And that's when the accusations and the complaints can come in. And it's once these things come in that we lose the light of God's countenance. Don't accept losing the light of God's countenance as somehow inevitably being connected with affliction and with trial. Two different things. Two different things. Losing the light of God's countenance comes with sin. You could take, though, somebody like Hezekiah and say, well, when the ambassadors came from Babylon to visit Hezekiah, 
You'll remember that Hezekiah foolishly made a display of the treasures that were in his own house and in the house of God. It was a kind of boasting. You know what it's like when somebody perhaps very superior to yourself comes along and, and you want to show that you, you might be on the same level or something like that. Well, <laughs> you want to do that. We want to do that. If we're foolish enough, that, that's our foolishness. That's our pride. And so he showed the ambassadors around all the wealth. And it was after that that Isaiah came to him and said, why did you show the Babylonians that? Within a few years, they'll come for all that. And we're told that in the matter of the, of the Babylonian ambassadors, now listen to this, we're told that God withdrew from Hezekiah to test him, that he might know what was in his own heart. And you say, well, is that not a matter of God removing the light of his countenance? And I would say, no, it's not a case of God removing the light of his countenance. God certainly removed a kind of guard from Hezekiah. And he removed a kind of guard from Hezekiah because, well, Hezekiah needed to know what was in his own heart. Why? Why did he need to know the reason? Did he not know that his own heart was deceitful above all things and desperately wicked? Yes, of course he knew that. But what he wasn't aware of was, was how his heart was leaning towards pride and him not being aware of it. You see, it's one thing to know the state of the heart. It's another to be aware of what it's actually doing at any given time. And so God just let him go for a while, just so that he would see clearly his own pride. But it's as a result of a pride that God removed the light of his countenance. In other words, had he not sinned with the Babylonians, he wouldn't have removed the light of his countenance. Again, removing the light of his countenance only comes with sin. And I think it's important to understand that. Friends, God, God will never take away from you the sense of his favor and the sense of his love unless you do something to warrant that. Why should God do that? He delights in love and he delights in mercy and he delights in grace. And you can be absolutely sure that that is not withdrawn unless there is a reason on your part for it. As someone once said, if, if God and you are far apart, guess who moved first? Guess who moved first? And that is what I mean by not only the scriptures teaching us this, but God's own character saying it too. He has no reason whatsoever to remove his light and his warmth and his favor, unless there is something in us that has warranted that. I'm not here dealing with various mental disorders, uh, which are a special category in themselves, uh, but I'm, I'm talking about spiritual conditions uh, uh, as they exist ordinarily. So if you've lost God's countenance and if you're lacking light in your mind and warmth in your heart, you need to examine yourself. Well, then the situation that we've got here is that God has left his people. But at the same time, here is grace. He says, I will return. I'm willing to return. And isn't that a wonderful thing? Um, if we sin like, like these people sinned, if, if we have moved away and if we have embraced idols, it's amazing that God doesn't say, look, you did this before, you've done it again, I'm finished with you. Or you've done it a third time and I'm finished with you, or a fourth time and I'm finished with you. But no, he says, I am willing again to lift upon you the light of my countenance and to give you clarity of mind and to bring warmth and joy and peace into your heart. But for that to be so, he says, you must return to me. You must return to me. I don't know if these people realized that they had left God. You see, we always justify your decisions. Because we all have consciences. And because we have consciences, even if we go in a wrong direction, we want to justify them. It's interesting that this people, you see, when they stopped working for God properly, they said, the time has not come for the Lord's house to be built. This people says the time has not come that the Lord's house should be built. 
where did they get that idea from? Well, probably from the fact that there was opposition. But since when did opposition become a sign that you weren't supposed to do something? Nobody would do anything ever for the Lord if opposition was a sign that it shouldn't be done. I suppose we can see how they concluded that. They said, oh, well, the signs aren't good, you see. I mean, we've started here and there's opposition from the Samaritans. Maybe the best thing to do is just to stop and to get cracking with our own houses and to settle properly in the land. And maybe we can build relations and then we'll start to build the temple. No, no. God wants first things first. First things first. And no providence should ever be read as though first things were not first. God says, I'll come back, he says. I'll come back to you the way I want to be with you and the way deep down that you want to be with me. But for me to return, he says, you must come back. You moved first. You must return to him. So I will return to you, but you must first of all return to him. Let's see tonight what real returning to God means. Let's Now may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.